Bethel Saints, if you would open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 18. Uh, where we are this morning as we're going through this, for those of you that didn't tune in on Wednesday, um, and of course, if you try to tune in with the video, that's what happens. Uh, the internet was down in the church, and, and uh, so if you really want to see Wednesday um, without any interruption, and if the internet goes down, it won't make a difference. Just show up on Wednesday, and it's going to be here. Uh, however, if you're, if you're there, we were able to get it um, later that evening as an audio, and uh, I think we're going to be able to get up the video, so um, just stay tuned to that. And if not, you know, tune into the audio. That's always the, um, that will be locked in. So we're able to get that through. But here in chapter 18, we're seeing that the actual aspect of where in 17 and 18, we saw the religious Babylon being destroyed in chapter 17. And here in chapter 18, the political, the economic Babylon is being destroyed. Those two things and where the world put their, their faith, their hope, their, their satisfaction in. And one was the religious system set up by the Antichrist. And of course, that wasn't a real area of worship because if you didn't put his mark on you, if you didn't do that, you couldn't buy, you couldn't sell. And so those that were already weak, they, they slid into that. We saw that already. But as that system didn't satisfy, we saw that um, we're back in chapter 17, verse 17, that God put it into their heart to fulfill the purpose. And where it says in verse 16 that the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. This is man's heart towards the religious systems of men. Eventually they find that they are emptied. They do not satisfy. There is no real relationship. It's just rules and regulations. And through that, as they find themselves empty, they rebel against it. And I think that's what we see so much in our day and age. I don't know if you've seen that people are rebelling against what you say, hey, come to Jesus Christ, but they always think of what that, that relationship that you and I have with Jesus Christ is a religion because that's all they know. And they rebel against religion because religion has made them empty. Religion has made them where they're, it's always rules and regulations, do's and don'ts. And yet the relationship with Jesus Christ is just draw near. Draw near. You're going to make mistakes, but don't worry. My blood covers you. Draw near. You're going to do well, but don't add that to your righteousness because it's all me anyways. Just draw near. Everything he says is just draw closer to me. Draw closer to me. Fall more in love with me. This is what fills our heart. And we see here that as we get into chapter 18 within this whole area of the, the where we're looking at this political and we're looking at the economical, um, you could call it commercial Babylon, is all destroyed. But it says this in verse 14. After it says that everything that you wanted is now wiped out, it says in verse 14 of Revelation 18, the fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things that are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. It's interesting that everything that they were pursuing, everything that they said, oh, I need this to fill the void in my life. I need this to fill the void. Because all of us, believe it or not, have a void in our lives. Every one of us. And that void comes because when Adam sinned in the garden, that which should have been so natural, God just dwelling in us, that here what God told Adam is in the day that you eat of it, you're going to die. My spirit is going to leave you, which is why it's so important for all men to eventually receive Jesus Christ, to be what the scripture says is born again, to become saved. That when you do that, the spirit again of God takes residence in your life. And now that void that is so, you've been longing to fill it with all these different things is now filled. But what happens is this, is we sometimes think, and, and I think that our society shows us this, that all these little things that you think are a void can be filled with something. And isn't that what advertisements do? They always try to tell you, listen, this is a void, but this can fill it. And even if you didn't think it was a void, I don't know how many times that I've gone through Costco and they said, hey, you know, have you found everything that you needed? And I have to be honest found things that I didn't need. 
But at this moment, I thought I did. And it's so interesting that all these things is even if you don't even think it's a need, all of a sudden that commercial comes on. And that commercial comes on, it's like, oh, I need one of those. I really do. I know I just ate lunch, and I know I just ate a big lunch, and I know that now that this commercial is coming on for a burger, why do I think I need the burger? I just ate, but yet something in me says, I need that burger. I need this to satisfy me, even if it's for a moment. But what we see is this, is those things that we think will satisfy us, understand, they will for a moment. That's all. And no matter what it is that we lead to, sin, the Bible says, is pleasurable for a moment. It gives you that, that sudden rush of satisfaction, that sudden rush of, oh, this is good. But then what happens is this. Then that rush wears off. Then death becomes what it always is. That void is back. Now, what else do I need? Because that momentary satisfaction, that momentary thing that I thought filled the void, I realize it didn't. Now I'm looking for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Now, what it says here in our text in verse 14, where it says the fruit that your soul longed for, the understanding in the Greek is this fruit is called the late autumn feast. The late autumn fruit that you have. In other words, the late autumn harvest has ended. And what that means is this, is that now there's nothing more to reap. There's nothing more to harvest. In other words, you have nothing now, and there's nothing more than you can get. Now, that is a panic to a lot of people. I mean, think about this. When COVID started, the one thing they wanted to do was what? Stock up. Oh, my goodness, will I need some toilet paper to last me for the next 30 years? Will I need water that I know it comes out of my sink, but I need it in a bottle to last me 30 years? And there's a run on these things. But yet we think, I need this. I'm panicking for this. And what happened was this, the late autumn harvest. You go to any store and there is no toilet paper and there was no water. And there was panic ensuing. Now, what it meant was this. The autumn autumn harvest has come. It's already over with. There isn't any more. You don't have anything anymore, and nor will anything else be coming. This is what was happening even in our society just a few short months ago. And we see the reality. We see the panic that ensues in here. This is what was happening. He's telling all these people that had lived luxuriously and were, were opulent and were looking to all these things that were, this satisfies me for a moment. Then this here I find satisfies me. And whenever it's lacking, whenever it's empty, I find the next thing that tries to fill that void. And this here is the hook. As we see this hook, what we're understanding is this. That everything here where it says now in verse 14, the fruit that you're so long for has gone from you. Everything that you thought would fill this void, now there's nothing left to try to fill the void. What are you going to do now? The Gospel of Mark says this. I want to read you that portion in in Mark 8 verse 36. And I want to just declare this scripture to you where Here Jesus says, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What Jesus is saying, listen, that you can put all kinds of stuff. You can have everything in the world. Now think about what that means. That means you can own all the property in Southern California. Well, that means you own its debt, too. Well, let's go to something else. It means you can own all the, the property that's there in Hawaii. They have less debt, by the way. And we see here that you can own all this stuff, and you can own all the business, you can own the world, and yet what happens? It doesn't satisfy. It's only for a moment. I love that saying that, was, that when, when Rockefeller was asked, he says, you know, what, what is it? How much money is enough? How much is enough? And he gave that classic answer, just a little bit more. How much money really satisfies? How much money really satisfies you? And he goes, just a little bit more. And then what? Then I need a little bit more and a little bit more. It's always just a little more. Now, here we see that the, the, the fruits, 
to which all their eyes were longing and all their eyes were, were there. And they said, this is going to delight my soul. This is going to delight me. All these things, these desires that these wicked men were pursuing, now they're gone. There are no more. It is at an end, fini, period. They now have something to reach for, which is nada, zip, zilch. There's nothing more that they can get, nothing more that they can grab. And everything that had made them comfortable, everything that gave them momentary satisfaction is now gone. What do they do at this point? There's a passage in the Gospel of Luke, and I want to read it to you. It's found in chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 15, where a man would, would come and he'd ask, you know, who, who made, you know, where he, he wanted his, say, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. He wanted this stuff. And in verse 15 of Luke 12, what Jesus would say is this, take heed and beware of covetousness. He's telling me, be careful, because if you're wanting stuff, if you're thinking it's stuff, beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of things that he possesses. Now, keep in mind that here Jesus isn't saying you can't have possessions, and it's wrong to have possessions, or it's a sin to have possessions. He's not saying that. But he's saying that if your life consists of what you possess... If your possessions are what's giving you comfort and peace and joy, if that's it, then your life is consisting. Now you have issues because what's going to happen when they're gone? Jesus told us what's going to happen out of all the stuff that's in the world. It's going to rust. Moths are going to eat it. Thieves are going to break in and steal it. And eventually everything that someone thinks is the amazing thing now winds up in a landfill or a junkyard or recycle bin later. Everything. One day this building will be rubble. It will be. And what's going to happen? Well, it's just rubble now. So you can't hold on to stuff. Now what we see is this, and I love the heart of it because after Jesus said, listen, One's life does not consist of the abundance of things he possessed. In the verse 16, he said, and he spoke this parable to him. The ground of a certain man yielded plentiful. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will these things be which you have provided? And so is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And this is that whole key where it answers that question in verse 21. When you're laying up treasures for you, treasures for me, this is for me, and it makes me peaceful, it makes me comfortable, it makes me have joy. But you're not rich towards God. And within this thing, we begin to see now that reality of what you know, Paul, when he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, and he made that statement, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Money's not the root of it, but the love of money is. It was interesting that our nation, this Christian nation that was founded, you know, they, they say under God, by God, this nation chose to become a capitalistic nation. At one point, I don't know if you're familiar that when it first started, that they wanted this whole area of socialism, that everyone could kind of do this and do that. We'd all kind of pool in together. And eventually, some people said, why am I doing all the work and this guy's not doing any? Why does my wife has to wash his laundry? What's going on with that? She's not happy with just washing mine, let alone having to wash my neighbors or this other guy down the street. And it didn't work out well. 
And eventually he said, let's become a capitalistic society that everyone is going to gain for what he wants. Now, keep in mind that capitalism itself isn't bad, but what happens is this. When it comes to capitalism, it's all about what? It's all about gains or losses, gains or losses, gains or losses. How much are we gaining? How much are we losing? And to be honest with you, that becomes what? The status of a nation. How great is a nation? Well, to be honest with you, when they say how great is a nation, we begin to think is what? How much money does a nation have? How much money does a nation produce? How many goods does a nation produce? And that's what makes America great? No, 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 no. A nation that submits itself to God, that is what makes a nation great. A people who submit themselves to God and to his word. That's what makes people great. Now understand, capitalism in itself isn't bad. But what happens is this. When, when here men love money more than others. And this is where that kick comes in. Because we see here that that's what Paul said to Timothy. It's a love of money that's the root. And when you begin to love money and your whole concern is about gains and losses, gains and losses versus... Loving God, blessing God, blessing my fellow man, the reason why God provides for me is so I can help provide for others as his spirit leads. And this is what's so important because we see here so much what happens is this money becomes a mean to bless me and bless me. And what God says is, no, see, you're a steward of my money. And what you're going to do with my money is this, find a way to bless me. And, and hear from my spirit on how to bless others. And this is that key. So when we see here the, the reality of what's been said, so often it comes to people are saying that money's a root. It's not. Money can bless. It can bless God. It can bless people. And so understand that capitalism isn't itself isn't bad, but when it supersedes your love for God, and your love for people, at that point, then the love of money is the root of the evil that's in our lives. There's a book in the Old Testament called Ecclesiastes. If you're familiar to where it is at the end of Proverbs, you can turn there. I want to read a couple of passages in Ecclesiastes because this is really when the, the whole understanding of what the preacher begins to write. And he makes this statement right off the bat. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2, where it says, Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, the word vanity has a better term to say emptiness. In other words, something that looks like something that is without substance. Put it this way. If you had this huge thing of cotton candy that had no flavor at all, See, cotton candy does have a benefit, the fact that you can taste sugar. That's the benefit of it. But if you had cotton candy that had no taste, you would have sticky fingers, and you would have this big puff that you'd put into your mouth and dissolve into nothing, and you'd have no taste. And that's what vanity is. It's something that looks like something, that looks like it has substance, but it really doesn't. This last summer, we were with our grandchildren out on our front lawn, and it was so amazing that we had these, you know, we'd put these rods into this mixture of soap and stuff, and you'd put it in the air and make these bubbles, and the, the bubbles were huge. But guess what? They were empty. And our goal was to see how far the bubbles could fly, and eventually they, some went across the street, some went over our neighbor's houses, some went pretty far, but eventually they popped into nothingness. And you would think, look at all these bubbles, but they're all what? They're all empty. And that's what he says here. It's all vanity. It's all empty. And so when he says vanity of vanity, he says the preacher goes, emptiness of empty. Emptiness of empty. Everything is empty. And he would go through and he would pursue wisdom and he would pursue pleasure and he would pursue accomplishments and he would pursue labor. He would pursue popularity and he would pursue wealth. And all these things he would obtain greater than any man had ever obtained. And he would say at the very end of it, nope, that isn't it. Maybe this would make me happy. Nope, that wasn't it. So let's go on to the next. 
So he would pursue wisdom and knowledge, and then, no, oh, that's not it. I still have this emptiness. Well, let's move on. Let's go to pleasure. How can I feed my lust and my flesh and my body? What can I do? And he realized eventually that wasn't doing it. What about the things that I accomplish? What can I do? And then move on to my labor and my popularity. I want everyone to just have these great crowds and chant my name. Eventually, you realize what? It's empty. Until he comes to the very end of the book. At the very end of Ecclesiastes, and I'm going to just do this whole thing that's uh, where I'm going to give you the answer to everything that, that you need to know about this book. At the very end, in verse 13 of chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. He said the whole thing is just loving God, fearing God, keeping his commandments. Now, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, beginning in verse 24, and I'm going to read verse 24 and 26, it declares this. Nothing is better for a man than that he should eat, drink, and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also... I saw was from the hand of God. So here, what the preacher in Ecclesiastes realizes is that the only thing that really satisfies me daily is when I do what I was meant to do, what God made me to do, what God created me to do that day. And I love it because I'm satisfied then. I have enough. If God says, I've, I've called you today to read my scripture and to pray and to seek my heart, and if that's what I did, guess what? I'm satisfied. If he calls me to do something more, go, go and write a letter to my friend or, or, or send an email or a text or encourage someone with scripture, and I do that, then I'm satisfied. And it's interesting that he says, this is what happens. If you do what you're called to do by God, there's this daily satisfaction, a momentary satisfaction. And so you can be satisfied in this day, but eventually what happens is the next day is, I'm still empty. But it's a daily satisfaction doing what you're created to do. And so as we're worshiping God, as we're giving him glory, guess what? I'm satisfied because that is truly what we are created to do is to worship God and to give him glory. But he goes on in verse 25 of Ecclesiastes 2, but he says, who can eat? Who can have and enjoy more than I? For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight. But to the sinner he gives work of gathering and collecting that he may give to him who is good before God. And this also is vanity and the grasping for a wind. And to hear what the, the, the preacher declares is God blesses those who seek to bless him. And often he takes from the wicked to do that. And I love the heart of this because God does allow us daily pleasures. He does. But the greatest pleasure that you will ever have day to day is this. Just do what God has called you to do. Now, going on a little bit more in Ecclesiastes, I want to read to you chapter 3, verse 14. And it says this, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. And nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. He said, really, the thing that's going to bring great satisfaction is this, letting God do what God is going to do. That's going to bring the greatest satisfaction. And I think what happens is this, and I'm going to bring it right into two days from today. There are some people who are going to say, my satisfaction is going to be determined by who wins this election. To be honest with you, my satisfaction is going to be when God does what God determines to do. And I'm going to be satisfied with that. Because my whole goal is this. I don't care who wins this election, in a sense. But what happens is this, my greatest goal is this, whoever wins, my desire is to use that to draw people closer to God. And that's what my goal is. And that should be all of our goals, to say, listen, my peace, I have a peace, but it's not on who wins this election. It's, it's in drawing people to find that peace that I found in Christ. That's where the real joy comes in. That's where the real peace comes in. So we see that whatever God does, that's what's going to be causing me satisfaction. 
And what he does, it's going to be forever. God's going to lock it in, and he's going to establish it. And I think that's the importance of what it is. One last passage that I want to read in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, beginning in verse 18. I'm going to read through chapter 6, verse 2. But it says this in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 18. Here's what I've seen. And it's good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all of his labor, in which he toils until under the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him, for it is his heritage. In other words, working hard brings joy. As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and have given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is a gift of God. So when that, you know, what you've labored for allows you to prosper and to partake of it, that's a joy. You can have that joy. It's not your only joy. It's not what you long for. It's not what fills you, but it is a joy for day to day. Now verse 20 says, for he will not dwell with He will not dwell unduly on the days of his life because God keeps him busy with the joys of his heart. So you're not going to be worrying about what's going on outside because my heart is satisfied. I'm doing what God has called me to do. And this is what happens when you're not doing what God calls you to do. The events of our society begin to just weigh on you. And that begins to be, where's my peace? Where's my comfort? Where's my joy? To be honest with you, I love the heart of it because my peace, my joy comes from what? Just doing what God's called me to do today. That's all he requires of me. Not doing something tomorrow or the next day, just today. And he now says in Ecclesiastes 6 verse 1, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun. And this is common among men. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that he lacks nothing for himself of all he desires, yet God does not give him the power to eat of it, but a foreigner consumes it. This is vanity and it is an evil affliction. He says, here's a problem with wealth. Eventually someone else gets it. (laughs) That's wealth. You can think, oh, no, no, I have my own wealth. Yeah, but then you die, and then you didn't take it with you. Now whose is it? Now it's your kids, and then eventually maybe your grandkids, or someone's going to you know, waste it away, and eventually it's going to be nothing. It's going to be given to someone else. But you can't ever take the wealth with you. And I think this is what's so important, because what these people here in the end times, they're in Revelation 18, the, the, all their soul's emptiness was trying to be filled with things. And yet scripture teaches us what? Well, we've quoted it before, but in Luke 9, 23, it says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross daily and follow me. And here's the question. How often do we deny ourselves? I, I want the joy for me first and then I'll do. No, God says, you follow me. Remember what he told about the rich man. What must I do to inherit? Well, sell everything you have, and then come and follow me. Oh, he couldn't do that. He went away sorrowful and much possessions. And it's not about letting the possessions rule you. It's about letting God and his heart and the worship for him, letting that be what guides you. So I love the heart of this because what happens is this. In our day and age, the real battle that we have is... In all honesty, it's a battle over facts, faith, and feelings. If you've ever seen the old diagram that you have a train, and you have the train, and then you have um, this this whole coal car, and then you have a caboose, small train, because you only have a little page. And, And what they do is over each of the train cars, you have fact, faith, and feelings, And the facts is what? Simply what the word of God declares. Faith is what fuels it. You know, that's what you have as far as I believe this word. And then the caboose is your feelings. That will trail. That doesn't control you. That doesn't empower you. And so the word of God is that which directs you. And the faith believing it is what moves you. And the feelings, they go behind. But so often, the real battle that we face in this world is a battle of Facts and faith over our feelings. In other words, facts and faith over emotion. Because of what emotions are powerful creations. Emotions guide us and rule us. 
I mean, how often have you ever heard of someone, or maybe you yourself have been guilty, that when your emotions well up and you're frustrated and you're angry, that you say things that you wouldn't normally say when what? When you're thinking logically. I don't know how many times that people have come on, you know, to for premarital counseling. Well, my husband said this and my wife said this and this. And but when did they say that? So often what happens is emotions begin to control us. Emotions begin to rule us. And when we're being filled with emotion, guess what? Reason and logic doesn't fit in. And I'll tell you what, when I become emotional and someone tells me that I'm not thinking logically, the only thing that does, it makes me more frustrated or more angry because you're telling me I'm not thinking thinking straight and yet in my mind oh it is so clear yet my emotions are controlling it and then when my emotions subside I realize boy was that a stupid argument it made no sense but oh during that moment it makes sense oh it makes all the sense in the world because it's being fueled by the emotion and here's what scripture teaches us that God says this Yes, use your heart, but don't disengage your mind. And I love the heart of that. Remember when, when the, the man came and he asked the Lord there in Matthew chapter 22, and he really wanted an, an honest, honest answer. And so what happens was this, that it, one came to the Lord, and in Matthew 22, I'm going to read verse 36 through verse 40, but he says this, Jesus... Or, he goes, teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. In other words, let your emotions love God. With all your soul, make sure that everything of who you are are part of this worship. Don't, don't hold anything back. And then he says this, and with all your mind, you have to engage your mind. So God doesn't want just this gushy feeling. He wants what? He wants these feelings to be fueled by faith on the facts of the word of God. And so as we begin to see this, this is the heart where he says, yeah, I want you to love me with your heart, with your soul, but with your mind as well. And then he says this, and then love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. And he says, this is the first and great commandment, what, which is what? what is God's word, obedience, walking, understanding it, living it. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor. On these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. This is the heart of everything with this what? Being fueled by love. I love it when Paul wrote to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 13. He defined love. He says, if you do all these things, speak with them in a tongue and angel. But you have not love. You're sounding brass. You might give your body to be burned, give all your goods to the poor, but if you have not love, it's nothing. It's a worthless, empty sacrifice. And so keep in mind that love is huge. Love is a part, but you have to have your mind involved. If you're a note taker, jot this down. If you're not a note taker, you need to become a note taker. And you need to jot this down. And after service, you need to find someone with a pen and pencil and paper and jot this down. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, I just want to read it to you because it's, it's key. It's clear. And I'm going to read from verses 18 through 20. But Isaiah, speaking for the Lord, says this, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. You know what God says? Engage your mind. Let's have a dialogue. Let's put the things on the table, everything on the table. And God says, engage your mind. Let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. He says, I want to show you a truth. And the truth is this, that you can have eternal life through me. I will be your salvation. And I love the heart of it because he says, I want to show you 
how you can be in my good graces, how you can be in my pleasure, and how you can experience my pleasure. He says, let's reason together. Though your sins were like scarlet, though you were dead in your sins, you're going to be white as snow. You can be alive again in Christ. This is a huge thing, and he wants to reason. He wants you to think. He wants you to engage. And so often we have a tendency of what? Well, rather than thinking about truths and facts, we let our emotions just rule us. I mean, you think about the unrest that has been happening in a society. Cities are burning. Our own city in Kenosha burned. Why? Because of people's emotions. They were, they were huge. They were just, you know, vehement. This happened again. And their emotions got the best of them. So what do we do in our emotions? Well, we burn down our own city. We loot our neighbor's stores. How does that work? Now, it may vent an emotion, but it's not reasoning together. There's no logical thing because now what happens is this. In your own community, and this is what happened in Minneapolis, they burned their own community. Now, the people who are living in their community, they have no stores. They can't go down the block to get, a, to get you know, what they need or a prescription or anything. They have to literally get on a bus. And what happens is the people in the buses are even afraid to come. Taxis are afraid to come. Uber is afraid to come. How do you get to the store now? And you begin to see here, it makes no sense. But oh boy, did it feel good at the time. Oh boy, did this emotion come. And what happens is this. In the book of Acts, chapter 17, I want to read to you just a couple of verses. I want to start in verse 2, and I want to read to you all the way down to verse 5. And this is key. Paul here... And it declares this, Acts 17, verse 2, Then Paul, as his custom was. In other words, this is what Paul regularly did. It was a custom. It was a tradition. It was something that he constantly did. He went into them, and for three Sabbaths, this is for three distinct weeks, it says this, for three Sabbaths, reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. So what does Paul do? He went into the synagogues, as was his custom, and he'd do this week after week after week. And what he did is he reasoned with them. Do you understand? He reasoned with them. He explained and demonstrated through scriptures, through intellect, through come now let us reason together, through facts that this Jesus whom he was proclaiming had to suffer. And he was the Christ. And through him and his work and faith in that work, by believing in him and receiving him, that you could have eternal life. He just reasoned from the scriptures. This was what Paul did. He went up logically taught. And then it said this in verse 4. And some of them were persuaded. Some said, you know what? That was a good discussion. That was really intriguing how you just open scriptures, you, you explain the scriptures, and now it's making sense, which is what we seek to do here on Sundays and Wednesdays. If anything that's within all the things that I'm saying, if it's bringing a light bulb to you, oh, that's, that's right. That is what scripture says. That's good. That's what we're here to do. Now, in verse 4, some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few Jews and the leading women joined Paul and Silas. But look at verse 5. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring out the people Verse 6, and when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren in of, to the rulers of the city, crying out, these have turned the world, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Now think about this for just a second. Paul is there reasoning, he's explaining, and he's demonstrating. In other words, he's having a discourse. But yet, 
we see that the Jews who were not persuaded, there were a bunch of people who didn't like the reasoning. What did they do? Well, they were now caught up in emotion. And now they go into the marketplace, and what they do is this. They took some of the evil men from the marketplace. In other words, they said, is anyone from Antifa here? Can you come along with us and be a part of this peaceful demonstration? And what was happening was this. They grab on to these people through their emotion, these people who were wicked men, and what they do is this. They set all the city in an uproar. They got the city doing what? Caught up in emotions. The whole city's now in an uproar. And, and what's interesting is this. They sought to bring out the Christians, and then they go to the leaders. And, These people, Paul, he's turned this city upside down. No, he didn't. He went in the synagogue and taught and reasoned and demonstrated. You, because of your emotions, turned the city upside down. And what? And blame Paul. How often does that even happen in our society that there's a group of people who are being led by their emotions, turn our cities upside down, light them on fire, burn them, destroy them, and then blame someone else who's constantly trying to just reason, logical, think about these things. And yet they can't handle facts. They can't handle truth because they're so caught up in the emotions of what's going on. And I love this scripture because the scripture just teaches us. It's okay to have emotions, but they should not rule you. They should not control you. They aren't what is in the front. They're in the tail end. And understand, I may be happy about things. I may not be happy about these things. There's probably going to be about 50% of the people on Tuesday who aren't going to be happy. But is it going to rule you? Is it going to control you? Is, is it going to simply say, yeah, this is now what controls me, my emotions? It's, that shouldn't be. And I think it's important when we see this so often, we have a tendency of letting these emotions, everything control us. Now, here's the thing. All of us at some point or another, whether you're a Christian, no matter how long you've been walking, there are going to be moments, there are going to be times where you feel an emptiness. And I hate to say it. Some people say, well, well, Christians could never feel an emptiness. Oh, yes, they can. Christians can feel an emptiness. Christians can be depressed. You can do that. And what happens is, is every so often there's going to be this, this void in me. There's going to be an emptiness in me. Now, here's the thing. What am I going to try to fill that void with? See, there's going to be a point where sometimes in our own lives, I'm just going to feel empty, and I'm going to want to fill the void. I'm going to want to feel good, because I just don't feel good. I feel sad. I feel depressed. I feel something other than joy, and I want to have some joy. I want to have some peace. I want to have all those things that God says are his that I can have as a Christian, and I'm not experiencing them at this moment. So what do I do? What do I do when it comes to this, this when I'm feeling frustrated or I'm feeling lonely? I'm feeling empty. And to be honest, you could be sitting in a room like this full of people. You can be in a relationship, a marriage relationship, and you can still feel empty. You can still feel alone. Because you're sitting here among people and you're seeing them worship and it's like, you know what, I'm all by myself here. You all, you're, you're caught on to something. I don't. I'm not feeling it right now. And we feel alone. We feel frustrated. What do we do in those times when you feel an emptiness? Well, good news. Scripture brings clarity to that. I want to share with you three passages. The first is found in 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, we see here there was a man, Elkanah. He had two wives. He had Peninnah and he had Hannah. And in verse 9, it declares this. That here, Hannah now, if you remember the passage earlier, had no children. And she was grieved. She wanted children. And so year by year, they would come, and, and she just wanted to have children. And we see in verse 9, then Elkanah, her husband, or wait, verse 9. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. 
and she was in bitterness of soul, and she prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Hannah, she's a child of God. She is an Israelite. She's there to give sacrifices. She's there to give offerings. And yet, although she has this double portion, in her there's this void. In her there's this emptiness. And she goes and rather than being able to celebrate God, she's caught up in this emptiness and her bitterness of soul. Do you realize that her very soul is craving for one thing? I want a child. I want a child. I want a child. I want a child. And what happens is this, she's so caught up in this that she begins to weep in anguish. Well, then, verse 11, she made a vow and said, O oh Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your maidservants and remember me and not forget your maidservants, but will give your maidservant a male child, and I will give to the Lord all the days I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. She realizes, I want this, I want this, I long for this. And then she realized, God, if you give it to me, I'll still give it back to you. I'll only be a steward of what is yours. This won't bring me the joy. Giving this to you will bring me joy. So if you supply me, know that you're supplying me so I can supply you. I can supply your people. I can supply your kingdom. And amazingly, what happens is what? God begins to move. God begins to minister. And he does. He gives to her a male child. And of course, that child will be Samuel. And But while she's praying, while she's doing it, Eli, Eli has no idea what's going on. It says in verse 12, it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli washed her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart and only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. And Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put away the wine from you. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I'm a woman of sorrowful spirit and I've drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but I poured out my soul before the Lord. Do you realize what happened? She has this vacancy. She has this emptiness. And she's like, God, fill this emptiness. Fill this vacancy. But you know what? It's more important to fill it with you. Whatever you put into it, it's yours. It's because I realize what? I'm yours. And this is where eventually when, when here Eli in verse 17 says, and he says, okay, then go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant your petition which you've asked of him. He realized that you are in anguish of soul, but you realize that no matter what you give to me, I want to just be a steward of it, and I want to give it back to you. I want it to be yours. You direct me. You guide me. You bless me. And so we see what happens in verse 20. It came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked for him from the Lord. I've asked. And he's going to be my son, but I'm going to give my son back to the Lord. And understand this, that she's been praying this prayer and wanting this prayer. Everything, God, give me a son, give me a son, until she finally says, I'll give him back to you. And God says, that's what I've been waiting for. How many times have you been asking for things? God, I'm needing this. I'm longing for this. I want this. But we do what? Well, James says that, that we, we, we pray, we ask, we do not have because we pray amiss that we could spend it on our own pleasures. God says, if you do it, understand, you're a steward of it. It's mine. It's not yours. Another passage I want to share with you found in the Gospel of John. And in the Gospel of John, we see this beautiful portrait that comes through this event that took place with Jesus Christ and a woman of Samaria. And within that event, we see this, that there's a woman that he meets at a well. And in John chapter 4, beginning in verse 6, it says, Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. It was close to noon. And a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. All of his disciples went to buy food. They go into Samaria, and as they're buying the food, now comes this woman in the heat of the day. Now understand that women normally wouldn't draw water at noon. They would draw it in the morning. They would draw it in the evening. That's when you would draw it, cool of the morning, cool of the afternoon, the evening. 
Now, why is this woman doing it at noon? She doesn't want anyone else there. She's not well liked among the women. But Jesus comes and she draws near to draw water. In verse 7, he says, give me a drink. Well, verse 9, then the woman of Samaria said, How is that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said, If you know the gift of God, and he who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. At this point, it perks her up. Like, something that's living? Running water that I don't have to come to this well. I don't have to come out in the heat of the day. I can have it at any point. And the woman says, well, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to verse 13, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst but that the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And Jesus said, Well, go and call your husband and come here. Now Jesus now switches gears on her so fast. She's now, Okay, give me this water. Give me the water. He says, well, Go get your husband. And now she has to realize, Oh no, I'm in trouble. Because here she says, I have no husband, verse 17. And Jesus said, oh, you said, well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. Jesus now opens her life. Said, what you've had is this. One man, and he put you away. Now, we don't know why. And I don't want to speculate on why. But I can imagine that when one husband put her away, what's going through her head? Where's her worth? Where, where, why does not this man want me with him? And then another one puts her away. Another one puts her away. Another one puts her away. Five men said, I don't want you in my life anymore. What kind of self-worth is that? And then the one whom is with you says, I'm not marrying you. Stay with me. Do all the things that you would as if we were married, but I will not marry you. What's her worth? And think about what Jesus does is Jesus says here, I want to give to you living water. I want to fill your soul. I want to fill this emptiness that's within you that you think you have no worth. Jesus is saying, you have worth to me. I want you. And it's interesting that as he goes through her life, eventually in verse 25 and verse 26, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things, the same things you just did. And Jesus said, I who speak to you am he. She was so radically moved by this, she leaves her picture, goes into town, tells the whole town about Jesus Christ. When she comes back, she brings the town with her. Now, here's a woman that has just met Jesus, had a conversation for a few minutes, goes and gets an entire town, brings the town to Jesus. Now, mind you, 12 disciples have been in that town buying food and have brought nobody. Isn't that crazy that those who would have been the somebodies, the disciples go, oh, my job is to bring food. Oh, your job is to be a light. Your job is to draw people and bring them to Christ. They come with food. They're talking about the woman. She goes back to town. She brings the town. And I love it because it says here towards the end that here, many people within that town began to believe. And it's just such a wonderful thing here where here in the Lord is, is, is opening up and speaking the truth and drawing people to himself, especially this woman who's just empty. And how often do we in our own lives you know, have a moment of doubt, self-worth? Where am I at? Who am I? Am I living up to my potentials? Is everything that I'm supposed to be doing, am I doing? And we find an emptiness. We find something that's vacant. And here's the question, what are you going to fill it with? Are you going to find something of an achievement? You say, oh, if I can do this, oh, that'll fill me. If I can do this, that'll fill me. 
What achievement do you look to to say, I need this to fill the void? The bottom line is this. The void will be filled with living water, and it will overflow you, and it will fill you, and it will satisfy you, and you don't have to go anywhere else because that water is found in Jesus Christ. He says, oh, you who thirst, come to me, and I will give you fountains of living water. Torrents will be coming out of you. That's the heart of God. Now, here's the key, and I want to close in this. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalms and turn then to Psalm 63. And in Psalm 63, I only want to read the first eight verses as we go through this, but I want you to see here what the heart of God is. It is a Psalm of David. And within the Psalm of David, it makes this statement, verse 1, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts. For you, my flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Isn't this the key? We look to all these things in the world, and to be honest with you, as great as America is, what America is is this, and I will, you can quote me on this, America is a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. What we need is this. We need the fountain of living water. We need Jesus Christ to come and pour out his spirit. That will make this nation great again. Amen. As we see the heart, as we see this, I, I don't want to, you know, cut down who we are as a nation. And, you know, God has blessed us. But in all honesty, we are a dry and thirsty land where there is no water because God is not God of this nation. We are one nation under God, but in all honesty, this nation, if you missed first service, you missed an incredible time of prayer. Because what we had was this, we were, we were just kind of praying and God was leading us. And it was about, you know, we really have an incredible nation. But to be honest, this nation is not under God anymore. We're literally saying we will not have this man rule over us. We will not be dictated by Jesus Christ in the scriptures. We're like the, 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 um, the nation of Israel where they're in the time of Samuel. We want a king. We want someone to, that agrees with us to rule over us. We want to be like the other nations. I want to be like them. And, and God would say, don't, don't worry about Samuel. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. And we've done that as a nation. And this is, and I don't mean to, to cut down our nation, but to be honest with you, I do mean to exalt Jesus Christ, and this nation does not do that. We see here, God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. And I love the heart because it's my soul thirsts for you. Isn't that what we do? When you really boil down to whenever there's an emptiness, it's what? It's because there's a part of me that is trying to say, God, in this point of emptiness, I'm going to try to fill it with something else. When you are a Christian and you feel a point of emptiness, know this, draw closer to God, and he will pour out his spirit, and you will overflow with torrents of living water. You will find yourself filled, but only in Christ. And sometimes it's, God, if I only do this with you today, if I only just, just open my Bible or read or spend a couple minutes in prayer, right now I'm hurting, I'm, I'm, I'm in pain, I'm, I'm going through a lot, Lord, but I do know this, that if I just follow what you lead me to do, as small as it is today, and to be honest, there are just sometimes in our lives, all we can do is a simple prayer as we may be in pain or worried or something else and just cry out, God, help me. And that's what he calls you to do. And that's the only prayer you say all day. Guess what? You can find pleasure in that. I called out for God to help me. That's all I could do. And now I'm waiting for that help to come. I'm waiting for a spirit to move. But he says, early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. Now, do you understand that not only it says it's my soul, but he points out the flesh. If you know about the flesh, in my flesh dwells what? No good thing. But I'll tell you what, there are times when the soul and the mind overcome and govern the flesh. That's now even my flesh longs for you. That is control of the spirit. And he says, my, my, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. 
in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I've looked to you for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. I've come and I've opened my word. I've sought you in prayer. I want to see your power move because, verse 3, your loving kindness is better than life. The very fact that you love me, I need nothing else. All I need is that you said, I love you, and that's sufficient for me. If I get nothing else this day other than that guarantee that you love me. And how do I know that he loves me? Well, greater love hath no man than this, than one that when one would lay down his life for his friends. This is what Jesus did. He demonstrated that love. I know today that he loves me. Why? Because I look at the cross. And I see that Jesus died on that cross, and now that cross is empty. Why? Because he died, he did the work, he went to the grave, and he rose again. That was God's stamp of approval on what he did. I will raise Christ from the dead. I will accept this sacrifice, and he will now live forever. Proof what? He's the first fruits that you and I will live forever in his kingdom. But this is the heart of what we see. And he says now what we understand. He says... In verse 2, so I've looked for you this sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. Thus, I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. That I will come and I will praise you and I will worship you. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you. Just It should be completely by accident, but you're, you're praying and you're worshiping. And there are times where I'm praying, and all of a sudden, the, my hands are being raised. There's no one else in the room, and I'm praying to God. And, and, and I'm worshiping, and my hands are going up. I'm praising God. This is what happens. He says, oh, my goodness. He says, my lips will praise you. Thus, I will bless you while you live. I will lift up my hands in your name. It's a way of just saying, God, you are good. It's almost like these little tiny kids. You ever see them? When, when, they're, when they begin to toddle, they do this. Come get me. Pick me up, Dad. Pick me up, Mom. I need you. And that's what we see here. My hands are lifted up. And we see here, verse 5, My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Now, it's interesting some of the best soups that I've ever had come from this little deli there downtown called Benjamin's. And they have this matzo ball soup that is absolutely amazing. Now what happens is this. You, you, you take the matzo ball soup and you just taste the broth. And the broth, I don't know what they do, but some of the best soups that I've ever had. Now this may gross you out a little bit. You actually take the chicken feet and you boil them. I mean, you clip their toenails first, of course, but you take the chicken's feet and you boil. And, and the, the, the fat, the marrow that comes seeping out of that is, is oh, my goodness. It's, it's that, I'm drooling, my goodness. But you, you think about the, the fat and the marrow and the flavor that comes through the fat. I mean, what makes the steak? Marble, right? The marble in the meat. That's what happens. And he says, this is what happens to you. My soul is satisfied with you, marrow and fatness. Oh, when I, when I taste that, that's what my body craves for. That's what I long for. And he says, God, you're that. You are that. You satisfy me in a way that that which I crave for does. And then he says, of course, in verse 6, my soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, meditate you in the night watches, because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. And it's so important that when you want to have that peace, you want to have that joy, let me just share with you one truth. Draw closer to him. Just draw near. Draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. Follow close behind him. Don't, don't get too far back. And, but what happens is follow him. Don't lead him. Follow him. And as you're following close, if you are a Christian, you've been a Christian for you know, a week or two, you'll realize that the true joy of a Christian is the closer I am to following Christ. 
The closer I am, the more joy I have. The closer I am, the greater the peace that I have. And, and no matter what happens in my life, the whole world can go crazy, but I'm at peace. Why? Because my eyes are on the Lord. Amen. We get to the point where there could be wind and waves and storms, but when you walk and your eyes are on the Lord, you can walk on water. None of this stuff moves you, but you shift your eyes and all of a sudden, you begin to sink in the storms of what's going on in the world. Get your eyes back on the Lord and realize that it's your love that is going to fill me. It's your love that satisfies me. And so often we have this point. And I think it's interesting that when we come back to our text, now that you see this context behind it, let's look at it one more time just briefly. Because in Revelation 18, 14, the fruit that you're so long for has gone away from you. Eventually, if you long for anything other than Jesus Christ and his word. Now, keep in mind, if you long for anything else in this world, let me share with you a truth. Heaven and earth shall pass away. Let me share with that again. Heaven and earth shall pass away. You might say, you know, earth isn't enough. We were talking about this on Wednesday, that people... People say, I want a star named after me. Can you imagine that? I want a whole star named after you. Know, you might just have a city named after you. Oh, yeah, you, you know. And there is a city named after me, if you know that. I have like three cities. There's a city here in Wisconsin called Lowell. There's a city there in, in Massachusetts called Lowell. I don't know why they named him after me before I was even born. They said, we're going to name him after this kid. He's amazing. But you may have a city named after you, and then you may say, Lowell, you, know, you might have three cities named after you. But I'll tell you what. I have a star named after me. Here's the beauty of it. None of these things satisfy. Heaven and earth shall pass away. That city that was named after me, all of them, they're gone. That star that may be named after you, it's gone. But his word will never pass away. His word that fills you will always be here. And I think it's so important that these people, they were longing for all this stuff. And we were going through it, you know, I, I pointed out all these things that were going on, and my wife had shared with me later that night, she said, that's like Amazon. You get all these departments in Amazon, I can get this in Amazon, I can get this jewelry, I can get what it says here, and I find it so interesting, verse 12, merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls, I can go and I can get jewelry, all these things. I can get fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet. I can go and I can get all this clothing, all the clothes that I can get, jewelry and clothing and all this, you know, what's fashionable today. I can get every kind of citron wood, every kind of object, ivory, every kind of object, most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble. All of the, the furniture and appliances that I can get of the highest caliber. I can get all these gourmet foods. Take a look, cinnamon, incense, um, Oh, wait, the, the, the perfume, cinnamon, incense, fragrant oil, and frankincense. And then the foods, wine, oil, flour, and wheat. And then I can get all these new forms of transportation. After he says the cattle and the sheep, I can get horses and chariots. I we need new transport. All this stuff that we can long after that you can finally get on Amazon is what? It's emptiness. And one day, believe it or not, even Amazon will be no more. And if the stuff on Amazon is what satisfies you, oh, I got to be sad. Oh, that didn't work. What's, what's next? What's next? What's next? It's interesting that by the end of this month, there's going to be a term. It's called Black Friday. The day after Thanksgiving, Black Friday. Now, they say it's the what? It's the time that all these companies now get in the black, from the red to the black. I made the sale. I made the sale. I'll be honest with you. I think Black Friday is really a picture of the soul. All these people are like, I can't wait because when I get this, it'll satisfy me. And if I save $5 on that toaster, even better. And that's what we do. I have to save money. If I can save $5, or I can save $10. But if I get this, it will satisfy me. And guess what? Saturday rolls around and you need something else. It never satisfies. And so I think this, this passage is so beautiful. The fruit that you're so long for has gone from you. I love the, 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 where our, the, the screenshot that we have, um, and hopefully you'll see it when we, when we get done, and, and after the worship, we'll lock it back up there, but it shows uh, an empty man. 
just this empty man. If you didn't see it when you first come in, and it, it has the statement, the fruit that you're so long for has gone from you. There are so many people that are longing and longing, but they find themselves completely empty and hollow inside. It's because you're looking in the wrong place. Let us be those who find the fulfillment in Christ and, and just walking in obedience to what he tells us to do today. Let that be our heart, amen? amen? Father, we thank you again for this word. Lord, you are so good. It is amazing how your word, this which you had John penned thousands of years ago, is true today, true right now. It is our society. You, you penned it perfectly. And you've also penned how our souls sometimes feel. We feel hollow. We feel empty. We, we feel like there isn't any hope. And we, we're just looking for some kind of joy. We're looking for something to fill us for just a moment. Thank you, Jesus, that it's you. Thank you that it's just drawing near to you, being close to you. And again, longing for you. And we do. We realize, Lord, with all these things... We're not thirsting for the stuff. What really happens in the heart of every man is we're thirsting for you. And let us be those who are led by your spirit, empowered by your spirit to share with the world. If you want to be satisfied, come to the well of living water. Come to my Jesus. And you will never, ever have to draw again that you will find yourself satisfied like me as we wake up and find ourselves in his likeness. And so do the work within our hearts, do the work within our lives. Draw us to you, we ask in Jesus' name, and all the saints of God said, amen. amen.